It's early October 1355, and Edward of Woodstock readies his army to cut a trail of fire and blood through the lands of Languedoc and Armagnac, which will leave over 500 villages, towns, and cities in ruins. The subsequent Great Raid would be darkly recalled for both its human and economic losses, as well as an embarrassment to King Jean II himself. After years of relative calm, the fight for the crown of France was about to reignite. Okay, imagine this. What if Raid Shadow Legends sponsored this video? You'd get to hear all about its awesome collection of over 700 unique champions, a super detailed and tactical RPG battle system, incredible graphics and intense combination of PvE and PvP content. Well, lucky for you, this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, so let me tell you some more. Each of the 700 champions has their own unique skills and abilities. Pick from 15 different factions, from Lizardmen to the Undead. Take on 12 hardcore dungeons, each with its own brutal boss fight that will test your tactical skills. Or jump into Raid's three exciting PvP modes, including real-time live arena. And the game is constantly evolving with new content, modes, features, and quality of life updates that made Raid the giant in the mobile game space, now boasting over 400 million players across the world. Speaking of new content, if you're looking for a new challenge, Raid just added Akamori, the Phantom Shogun, a brutal new undead boss that's guarding everything you need for accessory ascension, a new feature that allows you to upgrade your gear to even greater heights. You can play Raid anytime, anywhere, and if you haven't started yet, use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion, knight errant, and other cool perks. Smash my link in the description and join the mayhem. In January of 1355, it had been over eight years since the stunning triumph of Crécy under the leadership of King Edward III. Though capturing the strategic city of Calais after a long siege, large-scale hostilities had stalled following the conclusion of the Treaty of Calais and as the Black Death crept over Europe. In previous years, English-backed Gascon nobles had made inroads into French territory, manning key towns, forts, and strongholds with their own garrisons, particularly in the areas of Agenais and Quercy. However, following the conclusion of the truce, the French monarch was able to respond effectively to the Gascon menace. Naturally, as one of the more important nobles of southern France, the king appointed Jean, the Count of Armagnac, as his lieutenant in Languedoc, and the Count did not disappoint. Just two months on, he had already besieged the Gascon settlement of saint antonin and over the following three years, Armagnac had gradually retaken most of Quercy. Having utilized the wealth and resources of both Languedoc and his own county, Armagnac was well positioned to strike into the heart of Gascony itself by the close of 1354. Encamped on the banks of the river Lot, a mere 130 kilometers from Bordeaux itself, Armagnac had proved an effective, wealthy, and intimidating opponent, and it was this dire situation that spurred certain Gascon nobles to plead for aid from King Edward III himself. The venue was London, and in the January of 1355, King Edward III was celebrating the birth of his fifth son, Thomas of Woodstock. A certain Jean de Grailly, the capitale de Bouche, requested an audience with the king. A founding member of the famed Order of the Garter, de Grailly spoke for the pro-English knights of his homeland and claimed that though these men were bold in their friendship with Edward, they would be bolder still if the king were to send one of his sons to fight with them against the encroaching Armagnac. The implication could not have been clearer. King Edward's eldest son had fought bravely at Crécy, famously winning his spurs in the thick of the action. 
and though he had not held independent command in the field, he was nothing if enthusiastic at the prospect. A decade before, Henri de Grandmont had achieved success as King Edward's lieutenant in Gascony, and there was no reason why Prince Edward could not follow his example. In addition, Edward's presence would undoubtedly re-energize a Gascon fight back. King Edward ultimately agreed. As Edward's main area of possession in France itself, he could not allow an agent of the French king to threaten this prosperous region without a response. Armagnac's encampment at the River Lot may have not realistically been a prelude to invasion, given the likely fierce Gascon opposition. However, if Edward did not respond, he could risk undermining his own authority there, and thus expose his rich province to French predation and even eventual outright conquest. Yet the Black Prince's 1355 campaign was not the only show in town. It was a theatre in the wider conflict with France. During the winter of 1354, talks had broken down at Avignon. Though Edward had been willing to forsake his claim to the throne of France in exchange for an enlarged Aquitaine, King Jean refused to endorse the treaty, thus leaving Edward with little other course. Meanwhile, the force mustered in England numbered around 2,600 men, roughly half of which were men-at-arms, the other half consisting of archers. However, the Black Prince would not be fighting alone. Accompanying the young heir apparent was an experienced entourage of senior nobles, most notably the Earls of Warwick, Suffolk, Oxford, and Salisbury. Though ready to depart by July, the expedition was delayed, firstly by shipping problems and then through mid-August by contrary winds. The Prince and his army finally set sail from Plymouth on the 8th of September. The crossing was swift, without further contrary winds, and Edward landed in Bordeaux a week later. Upon his arrival, the Black Prince wasted no time in consulting his English and Gascon captains. The mood among them was plain. They wished to strike hard into Armagnac lands, even seeking a battle if possible. On the 21st, Edward was sworn in as his father's lieutenant in Gascony, within the Saint Andre Cathedral, and following his fiery speech to the citizens in the square, no one was in any doubt about the nature of their course. On or just before October 5th, the Black Prince led the corps of his army out of Bordeaux along the road tracing the Garonne Valley. On the march, Edward's ranks had swelled with eager Gascons, so that now he had anywhere from eight to 9,000 men under his command. Advancing into the open, populous, and rich countryside of Armagnac, an ominous pall of smoke traced the slow and calculated advance of the columns. Three small towns were fired on the first day, though a fourth conflagration at Montclar, where the Black Prince encamped for two days, was begun unintentionally. The flames became so fierce that the Black Prince himself abandoned the place for his tent in the field. It's easy to overlook the human dimension of this bloody business. Though coldly considered at the macro level by the leaders of the time, the direct effect on innocent civilians was brutal. Typically, officers ordered nothing to be spared. Every farm, hamlet, building and structure that could not be seized or of any use to the raiders was set to the torch. Yet this extended in some cases to even personal possessions and bare essentials. Clothes, bedding, and even cooking utensils were known to have been robbed in similar campaigns, alongside the more usual items such as jewelry and other movable wealth. All livestock, pigs, sheep, goats, and cattle were driven off for sale or consumption, with any beast that was not simply being cut down on the spot. Thoroughly terrorized, homeless, and utterly destitute, if they were bodily unhurt, such folk were the lucky ones. More humane commanders did try to avoid mutilation and other bodily harm, but even these orders oft times fell on deaf ears during the bloodlust of the mayhem. 
Yet if Edward or any of his captains felt any twinge of sympathy, this did little to stall their bloody progress towards Toulouse. The army steadily progressed through Armagnac over the next ten days, gutting and reducing enemy villages, towns and castles. Yet though French leadership had not reacted as yet, smaller spots of resistance sprung up along the route to challenge the invaders. Edward notably lost John de Lisle, a founding member of the Order of the Garter, while he stormed the battlements of the castle of Estang. By the 16th of October, the army had reached Nogaro, who, like Estang, resisted assault. However, though unsuccessful, the Black Prince was not at that time inclined to get bogged down in a siege of a heavily fortified town when much easier targets presented themselves. To the south, the Black Prince's wrath was focused on Plaisance. Though another fortified settlement, it was sparsely manned with just a small garrison holding the castle, but with the town itself emptied. In contrast to Nogaro, the French commander had little stomach for the fight, surrendering to the de Grely. Following the capture of nearby Galiax the next day, the army resumed their march from the charred remains of Plaisance. Wheeling southeast slightly, the Anglo-Gascon columns headed towards Osh, the ancient city and once capital of all of Gascony itself. By this time, Edward likely knew Armagnac was not there, the Count having elected to withdraw east upon his approach. To the surprise of both Edward and his advisers, no firm direct action was taken by the French immediately. Armagnac may have believed he merely had to wait out the invaders. This raid so late in the campaigning season was likely to be a short one, a savage but brief answer to his own actions. Once sated, the Anglo-Gascons would withdraw, especially since all the bridges across the Garonne had been broken. The coveted battle, if Edward indeed desired one, would have to wait. Meanwhile, on Monday the 19th of October, the Anglo-Gascons reached the town of Basseau. Though in keeping with his policy of not sacking church property, Edward ordered his men to remain outside. After replenishing his men with food, the columns left the unmolested town, bypassing the ominously walled and garrisoned town of Miranda, and with the prince halting for the night at a nearby abbey. Inching ever closer to Toulouse, the Anglo-Gascons burned Saint-Martin. By the night of October 26, the Black Prince's army was just 15 miles away from Toulouse itself though even still Armagnac did not stir. However, such meekness did not incline the Black Prince towards any suicidal assault. It seems Edward had learned his lesson from the loss of John de Lisle and their other repulse at Nogaro. He had already bypassed Miranda to avoid losses, his objective not a prolonged campaign of sieges. An assault on Toulouse was never a serious prospect, however, Edward, in consultation with his advisers, did have an equally audacious plan in mind. Scaling up from Miranda and Nogaro, the army would simply bypass the city. It's likely Edward was well advised that after a long, hot and dry summer, it may be possible to ford the river. Scouts confirmed such a crossing was indeed feasible and that, given the lack of any strong French defense in the area, Armagnac assumed such a crossing impossible. Yet if the Count believed it was the end of the campaign for his enemy, then he was to be rudely awakened. On the 28th of October, Edward led his army out of saint lys towards the fording point south of Toulouse. Reaching their destination, near to the village of Porte, the swift, rocky and terrifying river must have given all a second thought and reminded some in Edward's host, as well as the Black Prince himself, of a similar crossing during the Crecy campaign. Though it is said many doubted a ford was even present, Edward and his guides knew better, and despite Protestant rumors that no man on horseback had ever crossed there, 
Edward nonetheless ordered the advance. Despite their vulnerable state, the morning progressed without incident as parts of the army traversed the Garonne. The crossing was nothing less than a colossal risk. At the most vulnerable stage, the Black Prince's army was extended over three kilometers. Edward knew that the crossing had to be swift, because if Armagnac got wind of the operation, he could strike the exposed column and defeat them in detail, or overtake them on the eastern bank of the Ariège and the western bank of the Garonne, thus trapping the English between the two rivers. With the rivers effectively dividing the army into three, the Anglo-Gascon column contacted the second ford, while portions of the army still crossed the Garonne. However, though smaller, the Ariège was faster flowing, uneven, and thus even more dangerous. Fortunately for Edward and his men, their exhausted army completed their crossing with minimal losses and encamped for the night on the far bank of the Ariège. Though the risks were heavy, so were the rewards of success. Now Languedoc was wide open to the Black Prince's forces, and all without any resistance from the as yet unaware Count of Armagnac. Of course, the risks did not entirely abate. Armagnac now sat across both their lines of communication and retreat. However, the price was worth it, and such a move acceptable given Armagnac's inaction up to that point. In stark contrast to the inaction of Armagnac, Edward advanced to Montgiscard. Mistaken in believing they were protected behind Toulouse, the townsfolk had not fled and bravely resisted Edward's army, despite calls to surrender. Following Montgiscard's fall, the invaders sacked Baziège, then on the 31st Avignonnet. However, similar to Montgiscard, the folk of Castelnaudary resisted. Unfortunately, like Montgiscard, it lacked viable defenses and fared little better. The Black Prince's advance east appeared unstoppable to the notaries of the region. Améry, the Vicomte of Narbonne, rode on several scouting missions himself and noted the unrelenting and brutal advance. Large numbers of the enemy are now raiding both day and night, advancing on our towns and villages in columns, lighting the path ahead of them with burning torches. It is a terrifying sight. We have never seen such destruction. On November 3rd, the invaders reached Carcassonne. However, the challenge was more akin to the mighty Toulouse than the gutted Mangescar. Refugees had already informed the people there of the Black Prince's approach, and moved most of the people and movable wealth to the formidable Cité. Luckily for the locals, the city was comprised of a heavily fortified older settlement, separated from the newer burg by the river Aude. For Edward, the fortified Cité was not a realistic proposition, however, the undefended burg was fair game. However, even in the unfortified burg, the Anglo-Gascons did encounter some brave resistance. Small numbers of militia, armed with swords and shields, raised chains across the street to impede the invaders. This effort was in vain, however, as the Black Prince's horses leapt over the chains and archers approached from the rear to clear the way. The survivors of this resistance fled across the bridge to the safety of the Cité. Firmly ensconced, the Black Prince rested his men and received a joint appeal from the religious communities of the area to spare the burg from total destruction. However, despite an attempt to pay him off with 250,000 gold crowns, the Black Prince ordered the burning of the burg before setting off on the morning of the 6th of November towards Narbonne. Unlike Carcassonne, the Black Prince's stay at Narbonne was decidedly uncomfortable. Like before, the Anglo-Gascons occupied the burg, but were eventually persuaded to depart by the merciless bombardment of the occupiers with stones from the Cité. On the 10th, the Anglo-Gascons set the burg to the torch and began withdrawing under continued fire. 
Marching further north, the Anglo-Gascons passed on assaulting the heavily fortified town of Cuxac. It was here that a council of war decided it was time to return west, though not before the prisoners of Narbonne were presented and offered freedom for ransom. Those who could not pay were executed on the spot. Finally turning back, the Anglo-Gascons sighted the French army. However, Armagnac was content to shadow the invaders, not directly contesting their equally destructive march home. Edward's own confidence that the French would not meaningfully respond was demonstrated by his visits to religious houses on the return march, as well as his personal meeting with the Count of Foix. The Black Prince offered battle to Armagnac on several occasions, but the French commander refused to accept the challenge. The second crossing of the Garonne was achieved across a repaired bridge at Carbonne. On the 20th of November, the Black Prince's army headed northwest. As for the timid Armagnac, even with yet more reinforcements, he balked at the prospect of a battle, again refusing to fight when challenged by Edward. With the way wide open back to friendly territory, the Black Prince returned triumphant, if a little frustrated. For Edward and his Gascon allies, the Great Raid of 1355 was an undoubted success. A thousand carts of booty, as well as ransoms for captives, but essentially too, the campaign not only damaged King Jean politically, but practically impeded his financial power to wage war. Some 500 villages, towns, cities, and castles were destroyed. If including smaller settlements, a further 500 hamlets were razed, rural infrastructure destroyed, and the countryside burned. Such widespread chaos and damage significantly reduced the tax base of the French crown from contributing around a fifth of the total tax collected. Following 1355, Languedoc required tax exemption to help haste recovery, further financially burdening the French crown. In addition, we cannot forget the very human cost of events. The population of the area had been made destitute or put to the sword. Though often brushed aside as normal for such an operation, the memories of the Great Raid would remain scarred into the French psyche for many centuries to come. However, to the north, King Jean is about to muster his own army to crush the Black Prince. An iconic struggle is now close at hand. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1 or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.